So we've come down to Sandy Mount to a multi-sport club to speak to a multi-sport athlete. Now she is the antithesis of a jack of all trades and the master of none because she has played underage international football for Ireland. She has played basketball for Ireland. She's played inter-county football for Dublin. And then at 35, she decided to become an Irish rugby international. We're here to speak to the one and only Lindsay Peat. Lindsay, describe yourself to me. Well, look how I'm sitting, intense. <laughs> <laughs> um, a mixed bag. I don't think people see at times the various layers of Lindsay Peach until they, I'm comfortable enough to let them in. Which sounds very deep, doesn't it? But I think what people know me as is this really fierce competitor, which I am. Mm -hmm. Like, I have a son and I don't let the kids even away with it. That's how competitive I am. So, um, yeah, I think just fiercely competitive and driven is what people see. But then there's a real insecure, hopefully humble side that um, bit of crack before starting this recording that, you know, people do get to see as well, so, and I'm wild, you know, so there's varying levels of Lindsay Beat. Okay, we'll come back to wild. Where's the competitiveness come from? God, I think it's a combination of various strands of DNA from both sides of the family. My mother's not sporty, but um, she's ridiculously into fashion. And I've often used this quote that, like, I think that competitive streak, like, if you see her in a, in a sale, a River Island sale or a Zara sale, she will absolutely hunt you down if there's a piece of clothing someone else has, you know. Um, but my dad is ridiculously competitive. He's not sporty. He's mad into motorbikes and very intelligent man. He he salvaged them. He'll rebuild them. He's very much into vintage bikes, as was his father. So. Are you into bikes? I'd love to be, uh, but no, kind of, I suppose, I'm one of three girls, so that wasn't a thing for us growing up. But that interest and that competitiveness and when you find something you love, that's definitely from both sides. So. Um, I, on some level, I just found that love with sport mm. and wanted to be the best version. And it brought out different sides of me that probably aren't in other areas of my life. Do you know, mm. it's not a confidence, but that competitiveness drives you outside of any insecurities. Mm. Or I found a space in sport where I could just like not worry about the consequences. I could always have a lot more controllables there. Mm. So it was a little bit easier. Plus, I went into this like Wolverine <laughs> mode. Where I'm, like, ah. <laughs> I'm intrigued by that because I, I sometimes think and look at. <laughs> at myself and think how sport has changed me. Like I was this really shy, timid teenager yeah. and then all of a sudden I was pushed into this position way before I thought it was my time and it's completely changed the path that I was going to be as an adult. How, is, how has sport changed you from a personality point of view? If I had a, uh, what is a GoPro and record myself and the evolution of this uncontrollable, like. We speak about the competitiveness, but I there was a, I would think a very dislikeful person at times younger. Do you know, I fell into sport because my mother didn't want her eldest daughter run the streets. Like you're originally Clontarf, I'm Martine, not too far away from you. So there's areas around us, you know, if you got in with the wrong crowd, that's, that was her biggest fear, you know, mm -hmm. you'd run away. And she was a worrier now, but like, I was like, okay. But thanks to that worry, she got me out into basketball. How typically Irish, she met a girl she went to school and her brother was setting up a basketball team. And I wasn't even asked, she was like, you're going. But like, she just opened this door to a world that I fell in love with, that has shaped my journey. And it really has shaped the person I am today. So I think I would just be, a, I think I would have just settled, to be honest, for whatever life brought me. Whereas sport has driven me to be a better person and to hopefully on some level, even if one person inspired them, them to be different, having my son remembering that I'm now a parent and trying to bring those life lessons through sport to shape him. So I think it's humbled me and I've met a lot of amazing people who didn't take my bullshit, who didn't take my tantrums. I saw a lot of role models and a lot of people who showed me exactly what it is to have manners and be humble and to be grateful and as I said, they put up my bullshit. And then you have defining moments in life where you're kind of rock bottom and you come back to sport and those people are more important than ever. Mm. And your family are always important, but sometimes it's hard to reveal that vulnerable side to you. And sometimes it's easier to be that with friends. And even though it's unspoken, you just try and be better. And I'm humble sitting here telling you my journey, um, the almighty, amazing Brian O'Driscoll, and we're talking about sport and it's just, I don't think without that journey, I'd have this opportunity or, to tell my story or hopefully to have 
hopefully defining moments within the female game or with any of the sports I played, you know? The thing is, your story's wild. I interviewed Rena Buckley and, and she was competitive at two sports, at Camogie and, and, and Gaelic football. You, you've played um, international underage um, soccer, uh, international basketball, uh, inter-county um, All-Ireland winning uh, Gaelic football, and then at 35 you became an Ireland international rugby. Yeah. How does that happen? How, like, how, how can you park one and go, right, I can, it's like completed the internet, <laughs> right, no, done. <laughs> what are people not done here? <laughs> exactly, you know, next, <laughs> easy, right, park. <laughs> what, like, what, the, even the mentality around challenging yourself up to the point of 35 of looking for something new and you're still playing now, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I want to capture a bit of that and understand what that takes. This is what I mean, sport brings out something different in me. So if you were asking me to go for a new job, I'd be like, in every single way, I'd be like, you know, putting these blockades and, oh no, I'm not good enough, I haven't enough experience, no, there's no point in me going for the interview. And you put all these like roadblocks in the way. And for sport, um, though it was hard, do you know, I was like, okay, well, we'll just go along. Sure, it's a training session, you know, if we're in a few calories, it'll be grand. Um, so the soccer kind of came with school and stuff like that. Basketball, I always played. And then I didn't make an international until I was 26. Mm. Um, and again, the girls hated me and it took me a long time for them to see this other side. Um, and thankfully I have lifelong friends. You know, I remember Michelle Fahey, who went to uh, Iona in New York on scholarship and Suzanne McGuire. And uh, thankfully I played with Suzanne. But, you know, when I met Michelle first time internationally, like she was like, no, we hated you. You know, because they thought I tried to hurt them when I played and I was like, no. I just had a job to do and you were in white, the same jersey as me, so you're as such an enemy, mm -hmm. you know, but we're great friends now, you know. I was thinking I was not good enough to make an international. I remember Maeve Coleman gave me my chance and I took a deep breath and I remember saying, look, Maeve loves fitness. At least you can be the fittest version of yourself. And this change in Lindsay was like, well, don't be defensive about, you know, if you're giving feedback by whether it's her or players and her style, just take it on board, be interested, be willing to, make those changes, be willing to do the basics right, mm -hmm. um, be willing to be the fittest on the team and give absolutely everything. And after that, they look after you. And that's what I did. But part of me wanted to go, I'm not good enough to be here. Like, I wish the trial was over. And... Does that fuel you, though? That, that, that chip on your shoulder? Yeah, I think the I'll prove them wrong mm. has gotten me to where I am today. Mm. So when you see something positive written about yourself, do you try and put a negative spin on it? To yeah, keep I yourself? will. Yeah. yeah, like I am mortified <laughs> like that you've just listed all these things. And I'm like, oh God, I just don't know how. I'm just someone who loves sport and I just happen to fall into it. But I can't, it takes time to say to yourself, don't devalue that. Don't mm. undermine it because not many have done it. Like I no Sarah done Rowe has done it. Okay, in a Sarah, of maybe. Yeah. yeah, but not, not for, not at that level. Yeah, you kind of look back in your career and you're like, wow, like there are amazing moments that will be etched in my in my brain until the till I take my last breath. And so what are the highlights then? Every time I put on an Ireland jersey, every time I put on. Is Ireland sorry? Is Ireland the biggest one? And Dublin, like I won't devalue the community and and the value of Gaelic games within this country. You know, not everyone gets to be an inter county player, and certainly not anyone. You know, Kieran Whelan played for how long? Mm -hmm. You've been there, you watched him. Mm -hmm. That man should, deserves an all Ireland by the amount mm -hmm. of effort he put in, mm -hmm. what a skillful player he was. But I sit here in front of you with an all Ireland, and I got to play in three all Ireland finals. Every Ireland jersey, basketball, Irish rugby, Barbarians, um, Leinster when we played in the Big 12 against Harlequins and Twickenham. Like that was unbelievable. Playing a home World Cup. Like the list is endless. Like I sit here and I pinch myself, and I'm like, well, you have lived a dream, you know. So you start with Dublin football at around 09? Yes. And I then played that year I played actually international basketball and intercounty GA so while you, working so full time. <laughs> how do you juggle? You don't. Two. What gives? Relationships. Yeah. Do you know, relationships with friends, you're always saying no. And you don't think twice. I'm sure you've done it as well. You're like, no, sorry. It's an easy decision. Isn't it? Yeah. No, sorry, your wedding's the biggest day of your life, but yeah. I'm not going. <laughs> Thanks for being on that selection. Yeah. Lift you look gorgeous in your dress. <laughs> can't even make the hen. If I can't make the hen, great. <laughs> if I'm not training. But that's the, the brilliance of sport. But I probably I lost more than I won. And that's also the drive, mm. isn't it? Like Are that they, winning do, feeling yeah. is like a drug. Which do you think about more now? The good days or the ones that got away? Oh, the ones that got away. 
<laughs> what like is it about? What is it about them? <laughs> like you can't, you can't look back and go, 2010, what a year, or home recovery, you know, those moments. It's always like 2014 against Cork, or you know. What? That will always live. I haven't got over that. Like I haven't. Like I probably need to bring this up in therapy or something. <laughs> because that that's was, what this is. Yes, thank you, Brian. Let's try and get rid of this today. But it was like we were far superior for what. 55 minutes? Well, no, that's they had a good spell of 15 minutes, so whatever, 45 minutes, you know. We were far superior, far skillful, some of our football, some of the speed of our movement, some of the scores we got, some of the players we had, like, but Cork ran to All-Ireland champions consecutively for no reason, mm. you know. How, how long does it take you to pick yourself up after a defeat like that? Well, I never come back to county football after that. It's when I transitioned, well, unexpectedly to rugby. And was it a conscious decision, like, I've got to park that now with the, the no, disappointment I was so sad. being... Really? Because of I the disappointment? I was about 45 minutes in the chair, I could not move. Myself and Denise Masson. And we just kept going, how? How? You know yourself, you've played the All Blacks, you've played in Lions Tours Down Under, where you're like, wow, these are invincible teams. We're in their territory. How do we beat them? And they're too few and far between those wins, but that's why they're historic and they're, they're special. Let's talk a little bit about the rugby. So did you, you don't, had you, had you only played eight first yeah. grade games by the time you were brought on for, in that game against England? In yeah, for Claire Malloy. Yeah, for Claire Malloy. Um, any imposter syndrome? Yes. I was like, what are these? Like, what is this game? Like, I'm warming up in the stoop. It's like... Do you know Bucking. all the rules and everything? Are I you? had not, no. I kept going, I was like trying to grab the nine, you know, so there's so many different key areas to it and you have to know your job all the time. Mm. And as a prop, you're like, you're doing all this work, like, you know, you're clearing rocks and part of me in ways I was like, I don't want to do all that crap. You were going to be involved in the exciting stuff out in the back here, you know, but then they were like, you're too old. Like, do you know, when I played with Railway, I started as an eight and John Cronin said to me, oh, Aren't you looking for players, you know, cut up to the World Cup? We think you'd make a great prop. And I was like, listen, sweetheart, I only came here retired. I'm on the back of an All-Ireland, you know, I've lost. I've no kind of energy. Mm. Uh, I just want to try something new, you know, get back on my feet. And yeah, you know, I laughed at him. Are you glad you became a, a prop? Yes. Is that the right decision? Yeah, because I also had a, you know, I wanted to prove you wrong that props weren't, they were not these... Like we're not like an amoeba, we're not like this single celled animal that, you know, can only do one thing, we can only scroll them, you know, or, um, but I wanted to change the perception of what props were, mm. especially with the the girls game company starting back where the lads were before going into professionalism in 95. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to be the athlete, I wanted to be skillful, I wanted to be fast, I wanted to redefine everything that was seen as a prop. I'm interested to know your take on where women's rugby is in this country at the moment. Going through that transition from pre-adolescent to adolescent and it's a vulnerable time and we need just patience and uh, we need every, everyone to be kind of singing off the hymn sheet and maybe put some egos behind, beside and look at the game. The thing about the men's game, you've seen firsthand between professionalism coming in in 95 to how long it takes. It's very hard when the rest of the women's game around the world is like on fire, like it's up at a rate of knots. Like everyone's like, wow, England play France and Twickenham, stand alone, 60,000, what a great day. Like I was getting videos, the standard of rugby was exceptional. Like we want to aspire to that. Not ideal being in the WX um, 15, this new competition being in tier three. I think what we need to do now is look outside, get in good test games. I know England. Because that's what it's about. It's about playing teams that are better than you. And as much as it's it's painful, and sometimes you're on the receiving end of kind of yeah, you're like a whipping boy. Defeat. Yeah, but yet you're not necessarily going to learn an awful lot about yourself playing against lesser teams. The losses define you and make you a better athlete, and they make you a better team because the losses reveal those areas you need to grow in, and you either grow or you don't. Women are getting the opportunity to be professionals for the first time. I'm so jealous. Is it something you'd love to have yes. done? I think so, because when I look at it, saying I juggled trying to be a partner, a parent, full-time employee, 
have relationships with your family and friends and everything like that. I'm like, what could I have achieved if I got the opportunity to take all that pressure off and be a full-time athlete? How mm. far could you have gone? Mm. And that's the part I, I left, but I do, it doesn't devalue everything I've done. Do you get what I mean? So. You might have just had to pick like three sports instead of four. Ah, sure, listen, we throw in hockey, we try it, except for the skirt. So I'm like, no, no, I don't have the legs for a skirt. So I want to touch on something that I think is really important. Yeah. And I'm interested to understand your opinion on it. Um, you came out as, as gay at, at 30 years of age. Yeah. Why is it that it, it appears to be more acceptable to be gay in a female environment, in, in, in a female team that does men. It's just more accepting for some reason, this love and nurturing maybe with two women. That's, that's my take on it. I could be totally wrong, but... Is it because women are more acceptant? It doesn't take away from our femininity. Mm. But it's starting to change now, which is brilliant, right? Obviously with Gareth Thomas, initially was, I think, the first male to Yes, come out he was and, very brave. Um, <clears throat> Nick McCarthy recently. Nick and re recently with Leinster, you know, incredibly brave. And, and so it, it, it is true that... But we're under know. pressure. Like I came out, we've said there about coming out. You shouldn't actually have to come out, no, should you now, you really? Shouldn't. But I do appreciate for the likes of Nick and Gareth and myself, you take that responsibility, not for yourself per se. Well, I, I did it for me, but then to openly and publicly come out about it, you want to help others. Mm. You want to break down the barriers. You want to set what is the social norms. So you're there as a role model and hoping that if you do that, it's for one person. But well, that's it, ultimately. Yeah. You know, and, and it has a, a domino effect then. Yeah. That's the hope. Yeah. That it, you make it easier for one more person and then it becomes, it's like that situation of being, you know, being isolated. You yeah. know, we all want to just fit, fit in. in. Yeah, yeah, we do. And so when it's all of a sudden, it becomes like a, generic norm that, yeah. that whatever it is you know there's 10 percent of the of the population yeah. are, are gay so it's insane that you don't have that comparable or that ratio in sporting no. context certainly in men's sporting context and we should be just now instead of these uh, stats it should be like just be you whatever yeah. defines you just yeah. be you and just taking who's in front of you and mm -hmm. what do they value to your life are they a good person just judge them on that So when we were looking at a skill set for you to try and coach me in, I thought you were going to bring me for some... I did. I have a whole some, load of balls in the boot. <laughs> Shoot Steph some hoops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Downtown, maybe. <laughs> I can't help but feel a little disappointed. That yeah, because I've, I was like, I've, you know what? This fella will absolutely blow me away with any skill I give him with a ball. So I'm going to bring him down to like really something he may not be able to kill me at. I, my first ever position was in the second row as a 12 year old in Black Rock College and making up the numbers in the fifth team. Yeah. And then I got the ball once and I ran and they're like, mm, I don't think the second row is for him. Yeah. And, and so I don't I think the fifth team is for you either, <laughs> up you go. <laughs> a friend of yours this? Yes. Do you enjoy it? I didn't at the start. I hated being a prop. And I was like, I do not understand the concept of this scrum or this machine. And I was pretty poor at it. But if you look at say, jiu-jitsu or MMA it's about pressures and winning t it's the laws of physics winning the space and time mm -hmm. you know and my job as a loose head was to win the space against a tight head and can win this space to get in here once you could get in there and you could lift your head up they really had no power do you know okay. whereas if I didn't win that space and they got in that gap between me and the hooker game over I suppose the analogy is your front row's job is to win the angles and get you know prepare those angles and then your back five or your power so it's like a bow and arrow, so we're the targets and they're the power. If you've the hooker, so you be my hooker for a yeah. sec. So you can be uh, Dan Sheehan for a minute. So you'll have yeah. nearly a, yeah. depends on the stance, so split stance. I'd normally line this foot up. We'd have to all have our hips aligned. Yeah. If we can win the hit, yeah. the, if you can think of, I punch you first, you're gonna go back a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you win that space. Yeah, yeah, so you'll yeah. give yourself a better chance if you win that hit. Like there's such small mar margin. So you're waiting for one moment yeah. of weakness yeah. and that's when the hooker lifts the okay. strike and and push your way forward. Right, I, I, I need to use this nervous energy around this Yeah, let's hit. go. So that's, okay. So we'll okay. crouch. So I lean my weight, we'll bind. Okay. And then I'm gonna bring this. And on three, three, two, one, hit. And chase your feet. Yeah. The stands aren't great for chasing, to be honest with you. No, and I don't want to dirty them. Ah. <laughs> okay, yeah. all in sync, tap, leg, strike, drive. Yeah. And yeah. if you think for it, you want less time, so it's literally like a swing, 
to get back to this yeah, strong yeah, position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To get back to your strongest point. 100% points, you're yeah. like, give them less it's, time. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's six legs against five when you're 100%. up in the air, yeah. Like, so you'll try and load your weight across and if you've good height then and you get the hit and all eight are hit, it's like they, they suck up your power. Mm -hmm. So they're on the back foot. Mm -hmm. And it's so technical. Have you felt very uncomfortable in scrums at times? Yeah, but I think that you learn your trade then to never be second best. Do you know what I mean? So I have felt very vulnerable at the start, but you kind of like then become a student in the game to yeah. make sure then you outmaneuver yeah, your yeah, opposition. Okay. okay. Listen, thanks so much. No, thank you. Brilliant job. Great. Uh, so good to chat to you. And you too. So much to cover. Jeez, what a career you've had and still going. Uh, just about, but I'm, I think it's our awards night tonight, so it'll be, uh, they'll be like, and retiree tonight. <laughs> be... But I, well, one more year, yeah, one more like, year, they'll be calling, they'll be chanting one more year. I wish. <laughs>